is on. Hi there, I'm Josh Minnie. Welcome to this edition of Missoula Current. With me today, I have reporter from the Montana Standard, Francis Davis, and I have president of the Public Land and Water Association, Inc., John Gibson with me. Gentlemen, how are you doing today? Pretty well. Good? That's fine. All right, so what the show topic is for today is, I, I like to call it the battle over Ruby River. So really what it is is, is, is a show about um, public access to mainly water. Um, and there are some really wealthy people and some organizations in Montana that are trying to close off uh, the rivers to, to anglers. And the Montana Constitution uh, says that um, all surface underground flood and atmosphere water are property of the state for use of the people. Um, but to give us a little more information on the subject, we're going to start out with uh, John Gibson, who we have here on the phone. John, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. All right, so John, tell us, tell us exactly what, what the issue is here. <laughs> it's been going on for quite a while, you know. First of all, um, this James Cox Kennedy uh, posted uh, the river at the bridge on County Road, and then he strung barbed wire across and said, I don't want anybody here. And we had an attorney general's opinion at the time. The law had not been passed. And it said, you can't do that. And so we asked uh, Madison County if they would make him take that barbed wire down and uh, take his no trespassing signs down, and they refused to do it. So we served them with what is called a writ of mandamus, which basically says that they're not doing the job they were elected to do. And then he joined the lawsuit on their side. Okay, so there we went to the, finally got the district court. And two of three roads where he had blocks that crossed through his property, two were county roads, designated county roads. The judge found in our favor that he could not block access there, that the road easement was wide enough that it overlapped the, the assumed access law, and therefore when those two uh, came together, then you could access from the road to the river. And then the third one, the third road was Sailor Lane. Sailor Lane was not a designated county road. It was a prescriptive easement. And he claimed, he being Kennedy, claimed that the easement on that road was only the travel way, and therefore the easement was not wide enough to overlap with the uh, easement that goes along with the stream access law, so that therefore you couldn't get to the river at that road. And uh, we took, we appealed that to the Supreme Court. Then Kennedy uh, appealed, cross appealed, and said, I believe that the stream access law and the bridge access law are both unconstitutional. And he was joined by the United Property Owners of Montana, and he was also <coughs> joined by an, uh, an outfit uh, called PERC out of Bozeman, and they're privatizers. They believe that everything, basically, except the Army, should be private. Um, anyway, they, they went ahead and filed the briefs, and they're in this lawsuit, too. On our side, then, came Trout Unlimited and the Montana Wildlife Federation. So uh, here we are, lined up, and it's not just a battle of the Ruby River, although that's where all of the issues are. It's a battle for the public resources of Montana. Sure. Because if they can do this to us, they have us over a barrel. We will lose our opportunity to enjoy the rivers and streams 
and probably most of the public land as well. Great. Thank you for that explanation. Um, as you can see here, we have uh, Francis Davis, reporter for the Montana Standard, on Skype with us. Um, so now that we've got sort of the background on the situation, um, my first question, uh, I'll open it up to you, Fran, uh, is, is when did this all start? When, when did he start fencing? When did this James Cox Kennedy um, individual start fencing off his property? Um, how much land and river did he cut off to the public? And, and what, what was the public's initial reaction? Well, I know the, uh, the lawsuit, the initial lawsuit was 2004. And then I believe he has about 3,000 acres and about 10 miles of uh, riverfront property. Um, and my impression about the issue initially was um, here's a pretty clear case of the good guys versus the bad guys. And, um, you know, the, the people, local people want access and sort of out of state landowners who want to maybe cut off that access to the, the waters. Um, but then through my reporting with the standard, and I should say all of my views today are my own, not the Montana standards, but through my reporting today, uh, I noticed that. Uh, there's a, a third side to this with some of the um, local property owners. You know, I, I talked to uh, Dina Robbins, who um, is part of the uh, United Property Owners, right, that John mentioned of Montana. And, um, you know, they see it as some type of impingement on their property. These are local ranchers who've been around for generations. Uh, so that kind of complicated it a little bit for me. Um, and another angle that I think works into this is the fact that um, recreation has become a big business in Montana. You know, I think John could probably speak about how in the old days or 20, 30 years ago, people sort of had word of mouth or um, people weren't so uptight about access as they are these days. But I think part of that is because, um, you know, there's a lot of money involved with, uh, with recreation. But in terms of the initial reaction or when uh, Cox started stringing up the, the – the, uh, the wire, John. I think John might know that more than, more okay. than me. All right. In terms of when he actually put the wire up. So, so John, when when did uh, now I know you, now I know that there are more parties involved here than just James Cox Kennedy. And for the viewers out there, James Cox Kennedy is an out of state uh, media moga, mogul from uh, uh, Georgia, and he uh, is the. Uh, I, I believe he's he's one of the he's either the chair or he's he's one of what is he the chair or the the exec some he, he was he's the chair he's yeah. the chair of Cox Media which is uh they they own uh, uh, many uh, probably twenty something like twenty TV stations around the country and, and, and in addition to that radio stations and and also probably. Okay. Atlanta Journal Constitution. He's the CEO of CEO. The Cox Enterprise. So he's a big, big deal, big deal. Big uh, deal. Yep. And uh, and uh, so so James Cox Kennedy, he he uh, he fences up his land, and, and it, he doesn't want the common angler to to tr uh, tread through his land and in, in, in his in his river. Um, so uh, what uh, what our question was for you, John, was when when did all this start happening? Well, as, uh, as um, uh, the gentleman mentioned, uh, in, uh, I think, 2004, I believe we uh, shot, we filed the first lawsuit. So it's been almost 10 years. Okay. And these things work very slowly, but, you know, and that's one of the things we're up against because we're just a bunch of volunteers, public land, water access. Nobody gets paid anything. And he's got billions of dollars, so it's kind of an unfair fight. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, but okay. you have for us the, the Getz Law Firm out of Bozeman, and they're sympathetic to our cause, and they carry a cab for us, and so we've been fighting this, and we will continue to fight it until it goes on. If it has to go into the federal court system, and I hope it doesn't, then we'll we'll be involved there too. Okay, so, great. No, and that that is that is 
That is a good thing indeed. Uh, so, really, now, the, now, now, this person, this this individual, James Cox Kennedy, we'll call him Kennedy from now on. Kennedy, uh, he's saying that the Montana Constitution um, is unconstitutional, um, and really, what he's saying is that. He's saying it's unconstitutional because he believes that he he owns not only the riverbed but also the river above the riverbed. Now, with that being said, can anyone really own a river? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I I recall at the Supreme Court hearing in Bozeman about a month ago last of April, I guess it was, uh, his lawyer said my client owns not only the bed of the river, he owns the water in the river and the air above the river, and no one has the authority or permission to go on there without James Cox Kennedy saying so. And that law that... Uh, that's one of the justices said, wait a minute now, According to the Montana Constitution, that water belongs to the people of Montana, the state of Montana. Are you saying our Constitution is unconstitutional? And his lawyer says yes. Now, his, his uh, point for why he believes it's unconstitutional, why his lawyer believes it is unconstitutional, is based off of a Montana case uh, out of from 1925, uh, which the the uh, the ruling on the case was that that gives all landowners in the state of Montana guarantees them the right to the airspace airspace above his or her land, uh, and so their so their 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 argument is based off that law, correct? I'm not familiar exact with that law. I you know, there are other laws that said that, and there are other, there are other laws that said yeah. the opposite of that. You know, okay. Because there's certainly laws that support the public trust. And basically, that starts all the way back with uh, right after we won our independence from uh, England. Basically, they said what belongs to the king now belongs to the people. The people are the sovereign. And so, if you okay. don't have a deed for something, then it still belongs to the people. Okay, may I, may I uh, get, get Francis, can I have you chime in on this? this you know something about this. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you're right about that 1925 law. Uh, right, I was there during the court hearing as well, the Supreme Court hearing April 29th. The main law that um, Peter Kaufman, the lawyer for uh, Kennedy, um, cited. Um, he cited a few others, but that was that, that was the main one that he was using in terms of to overturn the Montana Stream Access, which is you know it takes a lot of guts I think to to, to be shooting for that law, which is prized by so many Montanans. Uh, but yeah, the 1925 uh, uh, Heron case, which um, I, I am not that up to date on the particulars of it, but it had to do with the airspace above the the the, the, own, the private. Landowners and that they they had they own the the, uh, the airspace as well as the the actual land. Um, so he was citing that he was so he was he was trying to cite legal precedent for um, overturning eventually. And I think in his case, hopefully, um, overturning that 1985 stream access law. Okay. So you're right on that. All right. Excellent. So, speak since we're on the. We're on the topic of laws and legislature. Uh, I just want to hit on uh, the 1985 stream access law, uh, part of the Montana state legislature, which uh, states that anglers uh, and other recreationalists, recreationalists, I'm sorry, can move up and down the stream as long as they're below the high water mark uh, or Correct. in the high water mark. So, John, explain to us, explain to the, us in the audience, what 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 constitutes high water marks? Well, it's 
it's a gray area. There's no question about that. But it's average or mean high water mark. It isn't uh, a flood or a drought. It's an average year. But usually, you know, if it, when a stream is ready for fishing by most people, the high water mar the high water flow is gone, and there is probably you know a fair amount of um, bare soil and land above the water level itself, and you can move up and down the stream on that, and because you are below mean high water mark. And it's been utilized and enjoyed and challenged in court. And we have won. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, go ahead, Francis. Well, I just, wanted, I just wanted to chime in here a little bit, going back to the, the Sailor Lane case. I'm, I think you're going to get back to that. But I think it's going to be real interesting to see what the Supreme Court says. Um, because... It was the original rule, ruling was uh, District Judge Lauren Tucker, and I cover um, Madison and uh, Beaverhead County, uh, where he sits as the district judge. And he's he's a you know he, he's a good man in my 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 opinion in terms of where he comes down on interpreting and being fair minded. Um, so he he basically didn't see that there was uh, I guess enough room. <laughs> And John, oh, John, maybe you can chime in here too. Enough room. Looks like we're, we're looks like you're um, you're breaking that, up a little bit. I think it was sort of interesting in terms of the feel I got from the Supreme Court justices, Montana Supreme Court, questioning um, Gettys, the, the the lawyer for the, the public land water access. In terms of maybe Tucker might be right on that, but in terms of overturning the '85 law and then the 2009 law, which he hopes to do, I just, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think he has a shot to do that in the Montana. You know, the Supreme Court's going to rule on this any day now. I don't think he has a shot to do that here in Montana. And it was pretty pretty obvious he's just trying to push it to the federal federal level. But um, to me, what's kind of the nuance of the case is how he actually how they're actually going to rule on the Sailor Lane case if it's going to um, because that may actually have more of a practical effect on stream access here in Montana. Because, you know, shooting for the home run or swinging for the home run in terms of overturning the law, I don't think has a shot, even at maybe at the federal level. Um, but in terms of the, the Sailor Lane case, in terms of uh, uh, what, what bridge, if, if they, uh, what bridge and what public road do you have access to? And it's going to be a case of where you can start um, going bridge by bridge. And, and so in terms of how they rule in that case, it's probably going to be, um, most impactful. You know, John might have an opinion about that, too. Yeah, so... Uh, there, there are really two other issues regarding Sailor Lane. And one is Judge Tucker, of course, Judge Tucker never proposed that these laws be overturned. That was all in the cross appeal. But right. the two things he did was say he agreed with uh, James Cox Kennedy that the width of the easement on Sailor Lane being a prescriptive easement was only as wide as a travel way, not including the borrow pits or anything like that. Therefore, he said, the easement is not so wide that it would overlap with the easement that is accepted under the stream access law. We challenged that. We said, how would you maintain the road then? He said, well, there's a secondary easement for the people who maintain the road, the state or the county. That's a whole new ball game. We've never heard of that before, a secondary easement on a road. You know, Sailor Lane is used by uh, school buses and ambulances and mail carriers and all of the things that a, a regular county road is used for. Therefore, it seems reasonable to us that it would have the same kind of easement on it. Okay. It, yeah, you see how it, can get, it gets pretty nuanced. Right. Are you, the other uh, thing that uh, Judge Tucker did 
did not accept was our idea that recreation travel is a legitimate travel to qualify a road for a prescriptive easement. He said he doesn't see that. Well, things have changed. You know, there was a time when recreation use had no association with commerce, did not mean much to anybody. Now, even the BLM reports that on their land, recreation travel supports more jobs than timber harvest, grazing, and coal. So it's a, it's a critical component. How you can say in this day and age that recreation travel wouldn't qualify for a prescriptive easement on a road is quite a stretch. Wow. Wow. And that's right. part of our appeal to the Supreme Court. So this uh, this ruling by the Missoula or sorry, excuse me, this ruling by the Montana Supreme Court, this this could this could this could be decided any day now. Tell us about what's going on with that, Francis. Well what I know is um, at the Supreme Court hearing in uh, April, April twenty ninth. In Bozeman, the um, um, Mike Weed, who is the uh, acting Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice, the uh, the Supreme, the actual Supreme Court Justice, recu recused himself from the case. Um, the acting Supreme Court, Mike Weed, said it would be a couple months, so April, May, June, so we're past that right now. And I know th things shut down pretty much around the Fourth of July, so I'm thinking, and eventually these folks that want to go on vacation for the rest of the summer, so I'm thinking within a week or so, or you know, or John might have heard something on this, you know, in terms of what he hears. But I think it's going to come down within a week or so. Um, I'm, I'm checking every day the Supreme Court docket, and I expect to hear it. I was half thinking, hey, if I hear it today, I might not be able to appear on the, the show because I have a deadline to meet. But it's coming any day. It's going to be real interesting to folks. I hope you're right <laughs> because you know, we're <laughs> kind of hung on this. We, um, we have other cases of road closures things like that that we're challenging. That's what we do, you know. There's, um, I, you mentioned Diane Roberts, Robbins, um, with Robin, yeah. Uh, there is a road that went through their spot. They own a piece of land up there called the Maybe Road, and the Maybe Road uh, was closed, and it's been used for 80 years by the public. And, of course, when you close that, they're outfitters, and they have uh, the road, the land behind it, private and public, for their own use. And we're saying you can't do that. There is, there's a prescriptive easement on this road. And the north end of that same road, it's a loop road, ties into the main highway below Fred Robinson Bridge up by the, on the Missouri, and it's closed up there by another outfitter landowner. And we're challenging that stuff because our opportunity to enjoy public land and water is being threatened, and they will take it away from us unless we fight it. And just if I can jump in there, when I I I, I talked to Dina Robbins and I interviewed her for the story I was writing, and when I first that was my first, like I said earlier, got the sense of it being a little more complicated than I originally thought. But as I mentioned to her, well, you know, this law, this cross appeal by um, Kennedy could could have an effect on the 85 law, the 2009 law. And she completely um, didn't agree with that. She said, well, that's not what I understand. And it, you know, it was right in his court brief. It was in his, uh, his lawyer wrote up. They were directly challenging it. And so that's when I really saw that there was some split between the local property, private property owners, and then maybe the out-of-state, or just in particular Kennedy, and it seemed like they had different agendas to me, and um, I was just really surprised that Robbins wasn't aware of Kennedy's intention to um, challenge these things, uh, these things being the 85 law, 2009 law. I was surprised she wasn't aware of that. Um, either she was, you know, and I trusted her response, either she was, a, you know, she was giving me a, a response and, and bluffing me. But just from my instinct as a reporter, she, she wasn't aware of this, this um, ultimate 
reasoning behind Kennedy's cross appeal, which I found really interesting. And, and um, you know, again, you know, my opinion, it, it just a little bit, it's manipulative by the Kennedy folks in terms of trying to push this through and um, especially, um, yeah, because he's not, he's not a guy who lives here um, full time. Right. I don't know how she could come to any other conclusion, however. If she <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, but she, I mean, I trusted her response that she really wasn't aware of this. She said, no, this is just about one single issue. You know, my, you know, she was looking at it from her point of view as, you know, a property owner. Um, oh, yeah. But um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I would like to have been around 20 years ago when, you know, there was more of a, an agreement between the property owners and the, the local fishermen. Now things are not that way anymore. Um, well, everything goes to the law, the, the, the court cases, and the, uh, the lawyers get involved. That, that was challenged twice, once on the Dearborn River and once on the Beaverhead River. And it went to Montana Supreme Court. And they said, no, the citizens of Montana, since they own the water, and the air above the water, then therefore they ought to be able to recreate on it, and we will provide them an easement on any stream in Montana that is capable of accommodating water-based recreation. Now, it has nothing to do with navigability or anything like that. It's any stream in Montana that has the ability or the capability to provide for water-based recreation. A lot of people don't understand that. They want to tie it to navigability. If a stream is not navigable, then it doesn't count. That's not true. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot to this thing <laughs> uh, and a lot of misunderstanding of what's going on. Comparing Montana to uh, our neighboring states, Wyoming, uh, a little bit farther, Colorado, um, what what are th what are those other states' access laws like compared to Montana's? Well, in Wyoming and Colorado, it's my understanding, if you're floating down the river, you can't even let your oar touch bottom. You can't wade on the bottom and you can't drop your anchor to the bottom because as soon as you touch that bottom, you're in trespass. Wow. So that's what... And just in terms of other... I'm sorry. I was going to say, just in terms of other states, the one I'm familiar with is um, Maine. I go each summer with my family. My wife has um, family that has some property there, and they have um, pretty much the same, and you know, I'm not exactly sure of this, but they might be the most similar to Montana in terms of their laws. They have the same high watermark um, access that to the, the public has to, to, to water. And so it's, it's, and I run into the same issues there, mainly just trying to swim. There's a, there's a guy who owns a piece of property right at the uh, head of the cove, and there's been a prescriptive easement for years through the edge of his property to get to the water and now he's trying to shut that down, and keep people away from this beautiful beach. Um, but from what I understand, Maine has one of the most liberal uh, stream access, water access uh, rules as well. And I, and I always see a little bit of similarity between Maine and Montana, even though they're far apart. Basically, that uh, fishermen in Utah, at least on navigable streams, should have the opportunity like we have here in Montana. But <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, legislature beat it down. I, I don't understand that. Where, where are the fishermen in Utah? I, I don't know where they are, but they're not standing up for their rights. Right. So, um, yeah, if people want to get involved uh, with Public Land Water Access Association, uh, how, how can they? How can they get involved, maybe contact you guys or, or, or possibly donate to the cause? Because I know you guys probably need some any help you can get with funding. Uh, yeah. You have a website, right? It's it's uh, PLWA. Do you have a website, John? PLWA.org. 
Okay, you hear that, uh, ladies and gentlemen? That that website is plwa.org. It stands That's for right. org. Yeah, organization. Dot org, and it stands uh -huh. for Public Land Water Access Association. Yeah. And what they're yeah. doing is they're trying. There it is. They pulled it up online. Uh, we're up on the web website, John. Uh, since you can't see here, uh, but yeah, we we got the website up on the screen. And uh, again, uh, people, if you want to get involved. Uh, with this organization, if, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, get involved in, in, and also try to defend or uh, protect your, your rights as a Montanian, uh, uh, you know, your, your right to access all, all water, uh, go check out this site. Again, it's, it's plwa.org. And... Uh, Francis, you write for the Missoula Standard. And become a member oh, for twenty dollars. Sure, John says you can we'll be accept any amount of any amount of <laughs> donations. John, John, we'll get donations. In fact, we got one the other day from Nova Scotia. Wow, now that's great. That's that's commitment. People from yeah, Nova Scotia yeah, must love the water here. Two hundred thousand dollars on on uh, the Ruby River case. Two hundred thousand dollars. Is that in expenses or is that, is that yet. legal fees? Nine, legal fees. Ninety percent of that is legal fees. All right. So you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Go on to plwa.org, and right. you can become a member for twenty dollars, uh, and you can donate right. uh, any amount that you'd like. Go ahead, John. You bet. All right. He says you for, bet. But we're a five hundred one c three nonprofit organization. We don't have any paid staff at all. We're all volunteers. Once in a while, we get a little reimbursement for long trips or something. But that's about it. And, and, and you people with children, you know, we're not doing this for ourselves. Most of us are old enough that we have been through the fishing wars and things like that, and we've enjoyed the great outdoors. But where is this next generation and the one after that going to enjoy it? That's who will benefit from what we're doing. Right. Just go ahead. Just to pick. Sorry. Go ahead, Just Fritz. to pick back on that, just in terms of the next generation, a bit a short personal story. I, this morning, um, I went out to. Um, I live in Dillon, Montana, and there's a, a, a slough here, a Point Dexter slough, that you have to use. Um, um, has to have uh, it go through it run on private property and it's going to be public access by the uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks um, uh, organization agency. And you know, I went with my son who's seven years old, and we, you know, we had to climb over a fence. The fence there was actually a ladder built over the fence um, by the FWP, and and um, it was just really neat. It was the first time I sort of experienced it because I'm I lived in Montana a lot during the the 90s. I'm I'm new here recently, and it was the first time I experienced, first time my my young son experienced it, climbing over the ladder and getting the you know, public access to the slough. And it was just great fishing. We didn't catch anything, but it was fun. And uh, you know, so I agree with John that it's it's you know it's it's really important, especially for the the next generation. Indeed. All right, gentlemen, well, uh, we're about to wrap up the show here. D is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go? Uh, no, I just want to encourage people to stay up abreast of this. Stay up with it because there's a lot of big money that would like to take this away from us. Lots of big money that would like to see this managed like they manage it in Europe where the landowner controls everything, including the wildlife and the fish and the water and everything. And we have laws that say they belong to the public and we don't want to trespass on uh, any of uh, the private property rights or anything like that. But those public property rights that we have, we want to maintain and we would like to have your help in doing it. And just um, just to piggyback on that again, I, yeah, I, as a uh, as a reporter, I, I my job is to report objectively on it. Um, but I know also as a sportsman that the laws here are pretty unique and special, and um, you know people should be involved and and um, 
you know, pay attention to what's going on. And sometimes these cases, you know, prescriptive easement, um, uh, words are thrown around and, you know, and it, it may be a little bit confusing to the average person, but it's worth the time to kind of dig in and figure out these issues and, and see what's going on. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, Francis. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, uh, we'd love to keep, keep updated on this story here at Missoula Current, so we'll probably be in touch at some point. Um, and for all my viewers at home, thank you for watching this edition of Missoula Current. You can go on to MCAT, check us out online on MCAT's YouTube channel. Um, also, if you want to get involved with Missoula Community Access Television, you can reach us by phone at 542-6228. And on Facebook, there's also a fa Facebook. There's also a Facebook page for Missoula Current. If you love the show, and if you'd like to support us, and you'd like to keep up to date on these issues that that we're facing, that these these important issues that you, you may not know about, you may not hear about. That's why we're here. We're here to keep you up to date. We're he here to keep you with the flow of what's going on. So thanks again, and I want to thank my my crew, my director. Scott Ramp and our production assistant, Mizuho Yamada. I also want to thank Joel Baird, general manager of MCAT, and the rest of MCAT for supporting us here to get this show on air and online. So thanks again for watching this edition of Missoula Current. Stay tuned.